I'm going to address the urban water management and what I see as the future. We are the ones with the blue planet. But if we continue to use it on the same level as we do today in the Western world, also in the developing world, we would use, have to use three or four of these Earths in order to survive. There are many challenges for this globe, but the urban water challenges can be divided into water scarcity that Inagrobici talked about, pollution, of course, but also very much infrastructure. All these three can be related to urban water population. If you look at the upper picture, almost the whole urban water population increase is coming in the developing countries. And of course, water availability. The water is not equally distributed around the world. And then, of course, urbanization. The migration of people from the rural areas to the, uh, to the urban areas, creating slums. And then, of course, energy. In my lifetime, since I was seven until now, the energy consumption has risen ten times. Just think about it. And, of course, leading then to climate change. And where has this brought us globally? You will see this picture again that Nina Grobitsky told you. Three million people without access to tap water. When the UN is talking about access to water, they are talking about water far away. But we need the water where we live, right? So half, almost half the population do not have access to that. And if you look at the wastewater size, even worse, 70% of the population have nowhere to take their toilet waste or their washing waste. Think about it. So we have to look now into the urban water and wastewater system. And the system we use today can be characterized by being a linear system, as Helge Batterbe said. It's centralized. It brings water from a source to the city. We use it. Then we discharge it into the nature. It is also a single water quality system. We use exactly the same water in most of our cities for flushing the toilet as for drinking. It is also characterized by being an infrastructure in decline. It's deteriorating. And we have to use large combined sewers in most of the cities of the world because not only are we going to transport our waste, we are also having to transport the rainwater. If not, we will have urban floods. And these systems are therefore very prone to urban flooding. And Poor pollution control, because not all the water can pass through the pipes. So therefore, we need overflows. And the overflow water is going directly into the nature without being treated. Let's have a look at the, how cities develop. I, I took Tokyo because I had this nice picture. You can see that in the center of Tokyo, the density of population was much higher in 1940 than it is today. But the city just swelled, and it swelled, and it became bigger and bigger. And what about the water and wastewater system? It had to fall. Bigger and bigger and longer and longer pipes. A centralized system. Bigger and bigger pipes. And of course, over consumptions with the many people may lead to service collapses. So they don't have continuous water supply, maybe, some of the time, they have to carry the water, even in the cities. And then you have this mix of sewage and rainwater that has to be taken by overflows, and much of this water will cause pollution in the cities. And then we have the political wanted urban densification problem or situation. These are this is the same area in Oslo, 1950 and 1990. It was the best picture I could find, actually. And you can see that it totally transformed. The surfaces, the grass surfaces, wood surfaces, became impervious surfaces. 
sealed surfaces, roofs, asphalt, uh, uh, parking lots, and of course, this leads to urban flooding because now the, the water is running off the surface at a much, much higher rate than it was before. Three pictures, one from Copenhagen a year ago. It totally changed water and wastewater thinking in the city of Copenhagen. Suddenly, they had really dangerous urban floods. In the middle, again Manila, actually, and in the lower picture, very close to here, is the urban flooding in a ice uh, melting situation. The causes of this and the causes for increasing of this problem is, of course, climate change. More extreme rains, more sealed surfaces. This is the most dense area in the Gamla Stan in Stockholm, I think. And these overflows that we can never get rid of. This is in Tokyo. You see a dry weather situation on the top and a wet weather situation. Clearly a pollution situation. And if you have a centralized system, all this water has to come down to the centralized point. And then you don't have enough capacity, maybe, and the water is coming out of the pipe system instead of into it. These are situations that we are facing more and more frequently now because of climate change. And all these problems are actually escalating because we have an infrastructure in decline. A lot of the water is leaking out of the pipes. Norway should be ashamed of itself. On average, 40% of the drinking water in Norway is leaking out of the pipes. Oslo may be 25, 30, Trondheim's not so bad, 14, but on average, about 40%. And the irony, is that this water is leaking out of the drinking water pipe and into the wastewater pipe. So we treat the same water double because we have to treat more drinking water and double also wastewater because we get more water into the pipe. And this is creating also complicated situations. We can have collapses of pipe systems, ruining the streets, for instance, and this is a picture that is showing that it can be very dangerous. Not only is it dangerous to drive, but you can even lose your car. <laughs> now, what about the developing world? Well, this picture shows you in the cities of the different regions of the world how much of the people is connected to water system and how much is connected to sanitation or sewerage system. The most striking with this picture is how few people are connected to sewer systems. We take for granted drinking water systems, but we forget that we also need the sewer system. In Africa, for instance, less than 20%. And we know all, all of us, the connection between wastewater pollution and disease epidemics. I was in Addis Ababa last year and I visited this area there was a slum area, actually, and they took away the slums and they built these houses, quite nice houses, actually. They had all the water services, all the facilities in the house. However, Addis Abeba has no sewer system. So the water from these houses, they were drizzling out of the houses down to this creek, which is about 100 meters from these houses. And if you look at the right, they are producing vegetables and what do you think they use for irrigation water? And the vegetables were sold in the market nearby. So you see the connection, wastewater, pollution, and health. Now, as Helge mentioned, many people are now calling for what we could call a paradigm shift in urban water management, away from the centralized end of pipe system to a decentralized or more decentralized closed-loop systems where we try to take care of the resources in the wastewater. Most important resource, of course, the water, but also the nutrients we need. Let me try to explain a little bit more the principle of a closed-loop urban water system. Let's say you have this city 
and it has a water source, it may be a river like here, but the river hasn't enough capacity for the city, but you take whatever you can, you bring it to the city after treatment, you, you, you use it, and you make wastewater, and this wastewater you treat very well, and you discharge it, not to the nature, but to a constructed reservoir. Let's say I've called it here an environmental lake. It could be also an underground reservoir, but it is a constructed one. And from this, you take the rest of the water you need in a loop. So the water you use is a blend of the natural river water and the reused and reclaimed wastewater. This is the principle. Is this fact or is it fiction? Drinking our own sewage? Well, Siemens did a comprehensive study of infrastructure in the 25 biggest cities of the world a couple of years ago. And there were questions about everything, infrastructure, but I remember one question. What will be your future water source in your city? And more than half of the biggest cities in the world answered water reuse system. It's the only option. Most famous example today, I think, is Singapore. Four and a half million people on a very small area. And they took most of the water from Malaysia. It was difficult, quarreling. So they decided to build a new system. They have a bay in the city, as you can see here. And what they did was actually to close off the bay from the sea, from the ocean. And then they take every drop of water that they can collect on this small land, being it rainwater, being it uh, harvested water from any place, being it wastewater treated, and they bring it to this bay. So the bay is becoming less and less salty. And they are using this water for supplying the city. They are actually also producing bottled water from wastewater. They call it new water. It has become very popular. The problem is that the chip industry is willing to pay much more than the people. So most of this water is actually now sold to the chip industry. Well, you would say, oh, isn't this very costly? Can we afford this? Well, look at this picture, also from a multinational company, showing the cost of water. And if you look at the red line, you will see that the cost of traditional water system has increased. We talked about earlier desalination. You can see the cost of desalination has decreased. Now they are make kind of matching each other. But that's not the reason why I show you this picture. I show it to you because of the green line. It's cheaper now to produce water from used water, to reuse water, than to produce it from the traditional way or by desalination. How can this be? The reason is that when you reuse water, you use it very close to where you produce it. And the cost of a water and wastewater system does not lie in the treatment, it lies in the transportation, in the piping. Desalination uses six times more energy than a water reuse system. So there is also this perspective that we have to take into account. Many of us think, therefore, into what we call integrated systems on district level, that also Nina Gorbitsky uh, talked about. I don't like to talk about decentralized system because then everybody thinks about its own treatment plant in every house. I don't think about that. I think about what I call semi-centralized systems. You can think of a city as having many districts and each district has a close vicinity to each other and has its own supply and treatment center. And in this treatment center, you deal with all kinds of water, drinking water, wastewater, storm water, you also deal with the energy, heat, uh, heat pumps, uh, uh, renewable energy forms, and so on. Sorry. In this district, the handling of the stormwater will also be extremely important. As I told you before, the traditional way is just to make bigger pipes, right? Now we talk more and more about local landscape-based designs. Open up the water. Don't close it into piping, as I showed you in the early example from also. Open it. And you have to take care. You have to be 
aware of the problem of flooding. And for instance, I have two pictures. One upper picture from Berlin, where you see this brook that has been uh, made a barrage as a bench along this brook. So when it raises, it will not flood the houses nearby. This is from Copenhagen. This street is now being built, rebuilt, to take water that's flooding over the, over the street into infiltration areas that you see on the side. Because let's think about it a little bit. For what do we use the water? Oh, we use it for irrigation, for urban uh, washing and cleaning, for industrial uses, for uh, household washing and cleaning, for flushing the toilet. Think about it. We use 30% of the water for flushing the toilet. We use it for personal hygiene, and a little bit we drink. And then we should ask ourselves, do we really need the same water quality for all these uses? In this mid-Norway area, we have an industrial network that we call Smart Water Community. And I would like you to follow, uh, follow me through this concept that we created. You can think about, we have this community. It could be a, a district of a city, as I said. It could be a small village. It could be a high-rise building. It could be a, an island. It's a community. And we don't have enough water. So we take water from whatever, for instance, from the city pipe if there is a one, but we only use 30% of what we elsewhere would have used. We take this water, we treat it very well, and this water we use for drinking, cooking, and personal hygiene. It doesn't create too much wastewater, actually. Most of the wastewater comes from the washing and the cleaning. And this water, together, we treat very well. And we put it back into a constructed pond or lake, as I told you before, possibly via infiltration of the ground. And this water we treat in another way, less comprehensive, and use that for the washing and the cleaning. We can take water for flushing the toilets directly from the lake because it will have already bathing water quality, because it is also going to be a recreational park. So it has to be safe. And very importantly, you see in this picture, the water from the toilet, we take out of the loop. We don't recycle that. Most of the problematic stuff in wastewater is actually coming from the toilet. Pharmaceuticals, nutrients, most of it uh, bacteria coming from the toilet. So we take that out of the loop. And we may treat it and we make a fertilizer. If it's a big district, we can make biogas. And also the sludge can be taken that way. And we collect the rainwater. And all water, as in Singapore, is going to this reservoir. Many people have had these thoughts before. And they have been very environmentalist friendly. They have talking about eco-sanitation, simple solutions. I don't believe in that. It hasn't proved itself. This has to be very high tech. This has to be big enough to have uh, people that are competent to do the service of the system. A very important part of this will be what we can call urban water landscape design. And these are pictures from China with actually systems very similar to the one I showed you. We will be using green roofs. And I think that urban water landscaping is becoming a new profession. And the next speaker will actually take us into that area. I will end up by quoting Michael Porter, who wrote the famous Porter Report, The Competitive Advantage of Nations. He said, competitiveness of a nation depends on the capacity of its industry to innovate and uh, improve. However, the question is, is the water and wastewater sector sufficiently brave, like this guy, to risk the innovative solutions that can bring us to a more sustainable future. Thank you very much.